negative, negative, positive, positive. Oh my gosh, I can't remember all this. My brain can't keep it straight. If you're good at memorizing things and you can keep this in your brain, then go for it. But I just try to go back to mathematically. Um, I know that to be a spontaneous, the reaction must have a negative delta G. So then going through my different scenarios, if both terms are negative, that means the delta H is actually favorable because a favorable, I mean a, a negative release of energy, uh, not a negative release, but a release of energy, which is a negative delta H, uh, is favorable for reaction. Matter tends to want to give off energy. And then a negative delta S, I'm looking at the second one here, is not favorable. It means that the, uh, the reaction is causing matter to become more ordered. So if this is favorable, but that's unfavorable, then this reaction is not going to occur at all temperatures. We hope it occurs at all. And it turns out that uh, to have a negative delta G here, um, I need this term to dominate because this is the favorable term. And so what does it take for this one to dominate? It takes for this term to be small. That means a, a low temperature. So that's the way I try to remember this. And if both of these are positive, that means that that term is unfavorable, but that term is favorable. So that means that if I want this term to be negative, this is not helping the delta G because it's positive. So this term has to help the G more than that one is. And so that means high temperatures, when this, the higher this term is, the more negative it makes the delta G because it's being subtracted off. Now you don't need to know what it means specifically. What is a low temperature? At what temperature is, do, you, do you consider it low? You don't really need to know that. Just know that the temperature, and you can solve for always the temperature, and just find the temperature and whatever is lower than that is um, going to make a spontaneous reaction. Or high temperature, there's going to be some threshold and then everything higher than that is spontaneous. If both the delta H and the delta S are unfavorable, then the reaction is not going to be spontaneous ever. No matter what the temperature is, you can heat it up to a million degrees uh, and it's not going to be spontaneous. So this uh, page is important. There will be homework problems about it. There's going to be practice test questions about it, maybe even real test questions about it. Uh, I think there will. Uh, you do need to know how the, uh, the signs on delta H and delta S will affect uh, the spontaneity of the reaction. And by the way, we'll do this at the end of the hour. You can always find delta G for a reaction um, by going to the table, the appendix in the end of the book. We've used it for the heat of formation. You may have used it already for the entropy changes, but you can also use it for delta G. Just look up the delta G of formation of the reactants and products, take product minus reactants. It's pretty easy to use. And you can even use Hessel's law with delta G problems. You have the delta G for several reactions, you can combine them and manipulate them as you need to. OK, and anybody still writing this? You good? Yes. I have an example I'm not going to do. Now let's take a look at this uh, set of containers. We have three containers. You don't have to count them, just trust me. Or you don't have to trust me to count them. Ten particles in each. In which container is there the most entropy, or are all three the same? Safal? The last one. Are you sure? Yeah. Why? Because they're like more spread out. What does it have to do with entropy? Because that makes them more disordered. Yes, that's true. Ellen? Like more There's more places that these particles can be when the pressure is low. Yeah, more positional probability in this container than in this container. They don't have very many places they can be, the particles don't. Uh, so there's, very, there's order in this one more so than in this one. So the lower the pressure, the, uh, the higher the amount of entropy. Is there a, a gas? <coughs> so we need to know that the entropy increases as the pressure decreases for a gas. And then the opposite for volume. If the volume goes up, the, the higher the entropy is. I've been touting Willard Gibbs as this thermal chemistry and thermodynamics genius, uh, he came up with another equation uh, that we're going to take a look at. The equation by itself um, is not very useful to us, but what we can do with the equation is, is to value in it. 
you're not going to like it because there's a certain term in it that people tend not to like at this level of uh, real lives. <coughs> See that natural log term? Yeah, you're seeing it right, natural log. Um, don't be intimidated by natural logs because we're going to be using them a lot in this class. We use natural log really for a lot of the things that we do. Um, it just is there. That's really why you learn about it in math classes so that you can learn chemistry. So uh, Gibbs said that uh, the free energy of a gas, now this gas is not doing anything, it's just of the gas, would equal, now what is this? I have a G and then a G. I'll talk about that, that G with the degree sign in a moment. Um, the, the G that would degree plus the RT natural log of the pressure. This looks like a degree sign. It's not a degree sign, though. It's a naught sign. And the naught sign represents standard conditions. When you use the table in the appendix in the end of the book, that table is only good when you're in standard conditions, sorry. Or it should be Andrew that's sorry because he's got some good head. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the not sign represents standard. When you're using that table, uh, that table is only for standard conditions. And when you look at it, it will say delta G with the naught sign, delta G naught, in kilojoules per mole. Now, I didn't write the rules on this. I just am, am the messenger to convey information. But um, standard conditions is going to mean something different when we're talking about thermodynamics than when we're talking about gases. And I can't answer why this is. But uh, standard conditions when we're dealing with uh, delta G's and H's and S's is um, one atmosphere of pressure that would be considered standard pressure, so that part's fine. But the standard temperature for thermodynamics is actually, and this is true, 25 degrees Celsius. So the standard temperature in gases is zero degrees Celsius, but when we're dealing with thermodynamics, standard temperature, same term, but it's 25 degrees Celsius. I don't know why that is. Why can't and it's not like you have some people that are into thermodynamics and they're opposing some people that are into gas laws. I mean, it's all chemistry and physics. Why can't they agree on one standard temperature? Is it a big deal to make gas standard temperature 25 degrees? Why would that be a big deal? It's not. It might change to 22.4 a little bit, but who cares? So maybe it's 22.3 or whatever. But anyway, um, they didn't ask me. And so when we're dealing in this class with standard conditions, we're going to not in this class, in this chapter, in this context, standard temperature is going to be 25. That's it. But we never use Celsius, sorry, so we should Yeah, you have to make sure you use Kelvin because, and I'll talk about that in a second. Let me just get the uh, standard conditions out of the way. There's standard pressure, there's standard temperature, and standard, uh, that also means one mole of a substance. It's always a kilojoules per mole. And for solutions, it's one molarity. So depending on what the substance is, this won't apply to all substances because if you have like oxygen gas, um, the one molarity really isn't applying to that. That's for solutions. These are dissolved. And then uh, as Vincent was just asking, this R term, When you're doing uh, anything with thermodynamics, you always have to use one value of R. You know how in the gas laws there were three gallon values of R depending on what the pressure unit was. In uh, thermo, you have to use 8.31 because the unit there is joules per mole Kelvin. That number of joules, remember a joule is the same thing as a kilopascal liter. And so if uh, um, we're using thermodynamics, you've got to use 8.31. Vincent? Is that what you're talking about? Yep. And yes, very often, this delta G is going to be a kilojoule, so that when you add something from this term, that's got to be in kilojoules too. So you'll probably have to change that 8.31 into 0 0.00831 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So just watch out for that. We'll do an example of that. Just yeah? Yeah, because that had atmospheres liters on top. 
and uh, an atmosphere leader is not the same as a kilopascal leader. So um, a joule is a kilopascal leader. So that 0 0.082 times 101.3 gives you that. So we have to use a joule. Only to keep our units consistent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the temperature in Kelvin. Yep. Now, when you take the natural log of the pressure, it should not have a unit on it. Um, and therefore, the pressure is going to be for these, I, you don't really need to know this, but the pressure should be at atmosphere. Yeah, I guess you will need to know that because you'll have to, we're not going to actually use this equation, I don't think ever, to calculate the G of a gas. Because, remember, just like with enthalpy, you can't measure how much free energy something has in it. All you can do is measure changes in free energy. We don't have any instrument that can tell us how much free energy is in this. We can look up the, uh, we couldn't even really. You can't look up the standard entropy, or um, you could look at the standard entropy, but since delta G, uh, I'm saying delta. Since G by itself without the delta, um, measures H minus TS, we don't know how to measure the enthalpy, the amount of heat that something contains. So um, without a delta in front of these, these equations don't have any physical meaning. So we're going to have to come up with a delta sign. Um, and it's not quite as simple as we wish it was. So I want you to just take a good look at this. I'm going to derive a relationship using this and a whole lot of algebra. I would suggest that you don't write it down unless you want to abuse yourself and your brain. In which case, write it down. Okay? So, and you can start not writing now. We're going to use this equation, this chemical reaction, as our example. This is a nice reaction for two reasons. First, all the terms are gases. Second thing is uh, that we have different coefficients, the not all just ones or the not all the same. So the production of ammonia, NH3, from its elements, hydrogen and nitrogen. Now what Gibbs said with this equation on the previous page, the, uh, this thing right here, it says that the free energy of any gas is equal to its standard free energy plus RT natural log pressure. Well, that means this. That means that the free energy of the hydrogen would be standard plus RT log of hydrogen pressure. This, free energy of nitrogen would be the same term for the nitrogen, then the free energy of the ammonia would be the same expression for ammonia. I have color-coded these so that you can kind of follow what, how the algebra is going to work. We've learned, now I've been talking about it, well the G by itself doesn't help us much, but the delta G does help us. So if we take the product free energy minus the reactant free energy, that's what delta G is. So that's what I'm going to call that. Delta G of the reaction equals 2 times the free energy of that minus the quantity, 3 times the free energy of that plus the free energy of that. So that's what that is. You with me so far? You see what I'm going to do next? All of these G terms, I'm going to substitute in for all that nonsense. Oh, God. OK. Who's up for writing this down and copying following? Andrew? Okay, right fast, Andrew. You ready for this? All right, so I have just recopied uh, the bottom of the previous slide. There it is. Delta G of the reaction is 2 minus the uh, uh, quantity of the others. I've color coded these as well. So I'm going to replace each of these G terms with that G standard plus RT natural log of pressure. Whoop, here it comes. <laughs> right fast. So that 2 times the free energy of ammonia is the same thing as 2 times the standard free energy plus RT natural log of pressure of the ammonia. And the same thing is true for the hydrogen and the nitrogen. Ah, I'm trying to get that little cursor out of there, but it's not. Okay, so you see I just made a little substitution there with algebra. 
now we're just going to clean it up and see what we can get out of it. We're going to use the proper